fun and action. Welcome to an evening with Doc Martin. You don't see many stand-up comics my age, and in fact, the whole concept of someone getting on a stage and just rattling off some jokes is a fairly new phenomenon, probably no further back than the 1940s. Before that, it just didn't exist. Jokes hardly existed. Uh, read the Old Testament from first page to last. Not a single joke. God never made it as much as a quip. What God did do is turn some guy's wife into a pillar of salt. He burned the towns of Sodom and Gomorrah to the ground. And he drowned every living thing with 40 days and 40 nights of rain. Maybe God thought that was funny, sort of like a, a, a practical joke. Uh, frankly, I, I don't think God had a sense of humor. Uh, I think he had anger issues. Who doth eat this apple? You, Adam? Get the hell out of my garden and take that bitch with you. So these days, I think, someone of any age can try their hand at being a stand-up comic and here I am this evening. Um, there is certain qualities, certain unique features, however, of uh, putting on the ears, certain changes that you notice, and they're not entirely congenial. Uh, when you get to be my age, you start to notice certain weaknesses of memory, uh, particularly memory for names like they're on the tip of your tongue. I had to fill out some government forms the other night. I forgot I had a middle name. And of course, technology is a particular challenge. I had to, had to pay my grandson 50 bucks to program my new iPod. Took him 90 seconds, and he's, he's four years old. He's got a vocabulary of six words. Mommy, Daddy, Grandma, Grandpa, Din Din, and Reboot. If I were to try and program that iPod, by the time I finally got it done, it would probably be obsolete. I would turn it on and I'd hear this voice, Ah, Martin, this is Roger. I am sorry to tell you, but your iPod is, is obsolete. It will no longer play your kind of music or whatever it is you call it. But for 500 rupees, uh, $500, we can change your iPod and make it modern again. I think I'll, I'll stick with my grandson. He's a very bright little kid. Uh, <laughs> several evenings ago, his parents asked if I wouldn't mind babysitting for him. They wanted to go see a movie, and they said, it's going to be an easy gig. It's almost his bedtime. Well, I had nothing special doing that night. My laxative hadn't kicked in yet. But I said, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll babysit for him. And sure enough, after well, maybe a half hour, starts yawning and bedtime for him. I put him up in his bed upstairs and do you think he went to sleep? No. Do you think he turned on his television and watched reruns of Mr. Rogers? No. Kid, four years old, turns on his computer, hacks into the U.S. Department of Defense. Because I knew nothing about this until I look out the window, I see the house is surrounded by guys in flak jackets carrying automatic weapons. Uh, I, I don't want you to think that uh, I'm a complete Luddite when it comes to technology. I, I do try and, and stay current. And uh, uh, you have a few bucks, you have certain advantages. And I'm proud to say that I, 10 days ago, I purchased what I'm sure is in the neighborhood, the first Tesla self-driving car. Uh, Tesla's an interesting corporation. If you look at all the outstanding stock, uh, the investment community values Tesla three times the value of General Motors. And I think, what, Tesla makes about 10 cars a year. Anyway, I got one of them. And uh, uh, as far as I can tell, I'm the only self-driving uh, car in the neighborhood. And it's a, it's a marvelous piece of machinery. It's, uh, 
very smooth and uh, effortless. And I just sit in the back and I read my Wall Street Journal and the car zips up and down all by itself, takes me where I want to go with very little effort on my part. Last week, though, I, I had some business out of state. So I, I left my self-driving car in the carport, went on my trip. It was three days. I come back. I find my self-driving car has picked up two DUIs and three parking tickets. Now, you know, I, I can understand the DUIs. That can happen to anybody, you know. Um, you have a rough day and on your way home, so you stop off, you have one or two or eight drinks too many. You know, it's, it's a perfectly normal human thing, right, Ken? Right. Uh, you remember that night, huh? I'm not too well. <laughs> I'm surprised you remember anything. By the way, I was, I was there and I want to tell you that night, I never knew you could dance like that. And, and very impressive the way the way you put that policeman in his place. That, that really was impressive. Your, your family miss you much? Was it six months that you were away? Yeah. Did those conjugal visits take the sting out of it at all? Or? Not really. No. Well, oh, 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 I can see that would be a downer. The, the correctional officers took pictures while you were doing, oh, that's, I can see that would be certainly slow things down. Why would they be taking pictures of, oh, security? She might have slipped a file in her vagina. Is that they're very, yeah, prisons are very security conscious. Now, you know, the, the, the correctional officers, they have their own YouTube segment where they call it um, criminals caught with their pants down. And I must say, you and your wife are very photogenic. You really, I think you have a, a new career ahead of you. Anyway, where was I? Oh, yes. So uh, the car picks up a couple of DUIs and uh, the three parking tickets, it, it was the same meter. It had overstayed this two-hour meter three times. So I wanted to see where this meter was and it's, it's in front of a massage parlor. I guess this is what they call, call artificial intelligence. It's not just devices that have changed that show the new technology, but all the things that functionally one depended upon are totally different now. Just in the last five or 10 years, take, take commercial radio. And now, you know, they used to advertise toothpaste and cigarettes. Now the advertisements are for these powerful prescription drugs. And they'll spend a minute talking about this new drug five seconds about what the drug supposedly will do for you, and the other 55 seconds describing the side effects. The side effects so horrific, I can't imagine anybody hearing this commercial would ever want to take this drug. If you take Lazine, you may experience side effects. Should you notice that you've lost the hearing in one ear, your hair is falling out, you've lost the power of speech, and it takes three strong, muscular men to help lift you off the toilet, see your doctor, right? <laughs> Maybe your doctor will see you next May. Um, but there is, <laughs> there is one commercial I think we do all enjoy. You'll remember it. If you should have an erection lasting more than four hours, call your doctor. Well, if my doctor were a 28-year-old former centerfold model, I, I just might do that. But under the present circumstances, my doctor is a middle-aged man with bad breath. I think I'd probably want to call up one of my old girlfriends. Hey, Susie. Oh, oh my God, where, where did that come from? If you had that 20 years ago, we would still be together. No. And television. Television is totally different. I remember, not in the distant past, where, say, Sunday, 9 o'clock, you'd watch an episode of Masterpiece Theater. And then next Sunday at 9 o'clock, you'd turn the TV on and watch the next episode. And then a week later, you'd turn the TV on and watch the next episode. Now, you can watch all eight seasons, all 
700 episodes in one sitting. Just make sure you have a porta potty and lots of popcorn. Uh, and I tell you, I know of what I speak because I have become a Game of Thrones widower. If you've seen this, this series, it's sort of a feudal thing, 7th or 8th century with castles and swords and things. And, and uh, my wife is hooked. I haven't seen her in three days. She's in the, the television, I'm sorry, the entertainment center for three straight days. I think she's up to season four. And I hear shrieks and cries and crashing of swords and so on. But other than that, nothing from her. I do my best to keep her hydrated and try and get some food in when she even thinks of eating. She did slip a note out under the door. She wanted something to eat. And she wanted a roasted ox head and a flask of mead. Uh, you know, thank God for Whole Foods. They, they have apparently a whole shelf of 7th and 8th century cuisine. You can get uh, a dozen stuffed field mice, uh, things... Uh, they have pig bladders. Um, because this being whole foods, it's a little pricey. A medium-sized goat pancreas will set you back eight silver talons. And it's hard to, to come up with eight silver talons. There are there. Um, I think Wells Fargo pays its employees in silver talons. You need a really big sword. And you go up to the ATM and you say, Wells Fargo, ID, smite thee. You slam your sword against the ATM and the silver talons come out and you put them in your hat, get on your horse and take off. So I'm able to, to keep her with the kind of cuisine that, uh, that she, she needs. And it's interesting, this show is just as violent and bloody as, as you can imagine. And when it first came out, I, it looked kind of interesting, the reviews. I said, let's watch this. She says, oh, I don't do violence. Yeah, you're right. Now I, 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 I can't get her to leave the room. Uh, she likes, uh, I think it's a historical aspect of it that attracts her, not, not, not really the, the, the blood and the gore. Uh, Sweetheart also loves to travel to exotic places. And we do travel quite a lot. And uh, the more foreign, the better except she also wants it to be perfectly familiar. It should be an exotic place, but feel like home, which means, of course, we always have to stay at a Hilton. They have Hiltons in every country in the world, and they're all exactly alike. A little different on the outside, but the rooms, the way they're designed, every Hilton is the same, which kind of comes in handy. You're in the middle of the night, it's pitch black, and at my age, you should got to get up and do your thing in the bathroom. I don't have to turn, out the, turn on the light and disturb Sweetheart because I know the layout of the Hilton room. I know it's three steps forward and two steps to the left, five steps to the right, bam, you're right there in the toilet. No matter what Hilton it is, that'll work almost every time. Every once in a while, uh, there's a little design change I didn't realize about six months ago. In Singapore, until the next morning, I realized I had urinated on the chaise lounge. But usually that doesn't happen. And uh, the other way she keeps things familiar is she takes everything she owns with her when we travel. I get to the airport. I'm just carrying my, my carry-on. That's enough for all, all of my needs. Sweetheart, she comes in. She's heading this row, this line of, Sherpas with the steamer trumps. They're coming in. Um, dock, um, dock, um. All six of them come in. And this is for a weekend in Palm Springs. Of course, it's more for, to check her luggage than the pitch the tickets. But that's just the beginning of the airport ordeal. Uh, she comes with all of her jewelry. I said, why, why are you all the jewelry? Well, if I leave it at home, someone will break in and steal it. I said, they take one look at you, they're going to kidnap you. No, they're not going to kidnap me. Oh, she also has flowers. We have some nice gardens, and she picks all the flowers. She takes them because, well, by the time we get back, they'll be dead. I want to enjoy them, so I'm taking them with us. So now we have to go through 
the Homeland Security check. Oh, oh, something else. This last trip, she's wearing these copper anklets. I said, what the hell is that? She said, well, it's copper. It's antibiotic. It, it, it protects you from all the bacteria in the air on the airplane. I said, sweetheart, we're traveling first class. There's no bacteria in first class. Well, I don't know. I can't get them off now. So off we go to security with the bracelets uh, and walking Tiffany kiosk in the botanical gardens. And it's amazing. Uh, we always get Letitia. I don't know. Letitia, I think, is, looks at the manifest, knows she's coming, and is lying in wait for her. Up we come, and there's Letitia. What were all them flowers? Did somebody die? You know, I have to check all those blossoms one by one, because they're miniature bombs now. There could be something in each one of them. He said, I know you're in a hurry. All these people now are going to have to wait. They're in a hurry, too. <coughs> but what good is it if you get on your plane on time, and it blows up in the air because I, I missed one of the bombs. I'm going to have to check each blossom. Now just be quiet and while I do that. And well, what's those things around your ankles? Those, what are those? Bracelets? You escaped from a slave ship? They don't come off? I was going to have to wind you now. Okay, now raise your arms. Oh, God. Ooh. Oh, put your arms down. Oh. Wow, don't you white people ever bathe? That's terrible. Madam, I is the supervisor. Now, you just, just be quiet, or I'm going to put you back and forth through the x-ray machine so many times, you're going to leave here a real blonde. San Francisco Airport is where we spend a lot of time, and usually it's our point of entrance and exit when we go overseas. And uh, I understand it's a big international airport. People from all over the world come in and out who don't speak very much English and they don't understand American ways. And SFO, San Francisco Airport, sort of bends over backwards to accommodate all these different cultures. But I think they overdo it a little bit. For example, they have these moving sidewalks. And when you get to the end of the moving sidewalk, this voice comes on and says, moving sidewalk has come to an end. Please step off. I ain't stepping off. I'm going to stay on this thing. I want to see where this sucker goes. Then they have this big elevator that takes you down to the baggage floor. And uh, again, you arrive at the baggage floor and this voice comes on. To exit elevator, press blue button. Wait until door opens. I'm not waiting for anybody, man. I'm coming out of there now. But I suppose, again, you have to spell things out for people if, if the culture is, is not familiar. So there's a lot of changes that uh, I've had to get used to in one hell of a hurry. But there are certain things that I don't think ever change. And if you're a family man and you have children and grandchildren, uh, one of the things that I suspect uh, never alters generation from generation is adolescence. And uh, you know, I think back fondly to when my daughter was 13, going on 14, and uh, she had her first boyfriend. And you know, her mother you know, did her best to kind of tell her about the facts of life, uh, intimate things, from a mother's perspective. But I felt, you know, Dad is part of the real world out there. She needs to hear something about the birds and the bees from her father. So I took her aside and I said, Sweetheart, uh, I have to talk to you about something. Oh, we know all about that, Dad. What do you mean you know all about that? I haven't even told you what I'm going to talk to you about. Oh, I can see on your face. You want to talk about the birds and the bees. We kids, we know all about that. Yeah, right, I'm sure. You're, what are you, 13 and a half? Oh, we do. We're very smart. We're, we read, we see we're online. Oh, right, right. All right. I tell you what. We'll sit down 
and you tell your father all that you know or you think you know about the birds and the bees, and if perchance it's just a few little details that you don't know, that you may have left out, haven't heard about, uh, that I can fill in, just a few trivial little things, I will. But you tell me what you think you know about sexual matters, and I'll just sit here and I'll listen. So I sat to listen, and sweetheart told me what she knew. Two and a half hours later, I said, okay, that's, that's very impressive, dear. I, I, I've learned a lot. Thank you for, for that. I'll make a deal with you. If you promise with this new boyfriend to, to keep all that you know theoretical, I'll give you a hundred bucks. Okay, Dad, that's good. Took the hundred bucks. Three months later, the boyfriend is out. She's got a new boyfriend. Hits me up for another hundred bucks. So you see, there's certain things that probably stay from one generation to another. Well, speaking of the passage of time, she mine is almost out, and I want to thank you for enjoying this evening with me. Good night.